tonight's theme was rescued. We asked for stories about being saved or saving someone else, and we had quite the response. That's right, over 30 submissions were received, and we narrowed them down to seven, and we couldn't be more excited. The first storyteller is Michelle Vasquez. Michelle tells a story of a would-be stalker who captured her heart. Please put your hands together for Michelle Vasquez. They say love finds you when you least expect it. And in my case, it was true. It was 1986, and I was a sophomore at Stanford. I'd just finished my sophomore year, and I'd gotten an internship in San Francisco. That meant that every day I needed to commute on the bus. Well, one day, I got on the bus, and I was minding my own business, but I had the feeling that somebody was watching me. So I looked up, and there, in the aisle in the back, was a man with a dark suit on and a briefcase, boring a hole in my forehead with his eyes. Well, I got creeped out. So I got off the bus early, and I started walking. And I noticed he followed me. So I started walking faster. And he started walking faster. And then I crossed the street, and he crossed the street, so I ran. <laughs> I was very upset because there had been quite a few stalking incidences in San Francisco at the time, and I didn't want to be a victim. Well, it rolled off. I calmed down. The week went by. And I got invited to a party on campus. So as I enter the house and go into the living room, who do I see? The stalker. <laughs> well, I went and gave him a piece of my mind. Who do you think you are, I said. You scared the living daylights out of me. You stalked me and followed me off the bus. To which he replied, whoa, wait a minute. First of all, I go to Stanford. Second of all, you got off at my stop. And third of all, I'd been riding the bus with you every day, but you never noticed me. <laughs> you got off the bus, you started walking faster, you crossed the street, and then you ran. I couldn't get close enough to say hello. Well, I was dazed and confused for a moment because I wanted to be angry, but all I could do was stare into his dreamy blue eyes. <laughs> so I decided to give him another chance. Okay. I'm Drew, let's start over. I'm from South Dakota. And with that silky smooth voice, that's all it took, I was smitten. <laughs> Drew was the kind of guy you could take home to mom. He was kind and generous and compassionate. And he was a Renaissance man. In one day, he'd be able to write me some poetry and at the same time develop an algorithmic model to be predict behaviors. Yeah, he was smart. Well, years went by. We graduated and moved to New York City, the city of our dreams. And it was great until it wasn't. See, Drew wanted to meet with me, and we met. And I'll never forget his words. I've been diagnosed with a brain tumor. I need brain surgery. And at that moment, I was overwhelmed, and I didn't know how to react. So I did the only thing I could do, which was cry and tell him that we would fight cancer together. And we did. And we won. Right on. We wanted to celebrate, so we decided to get married right here at the St. Joseph's Church. And I'll never forget the intensity of our vows, for rich or for poor, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. We lived these words. They weren't simply words we were repeating. We were happy to have a second lease on life, so we moved to San Francisco to start over. And life was great. We had no complaints about the life we were living. It was beautiful, until it wasn't, because the cancer came back, and this time it was more aggressive. The cancer came back, and it changed the nature of our relationship, from husband and wife to patient and caregiver. Trust and compassion were the values that we valued the most. We decided to fight cancer, and we won again. Fast forward. We needed to wait fast five years before we would find out if 
he was truly going to be cancer free. And so we waited patiently, and that tested the limits of our patience. We waited year after year, and finally went to the doctor in the hopes that he would tell us something good. And we jumped for joy when we heard, Drew is cancer free. Well, we didn't know what to do with ourselves, so I sent him off with his buddy to have a beer, and I went off and to make phone calls and to let family know what we were up to. Well, I got into the apartment, and the phone rang, and I was so excited to tell whoever that Drew was cancer-free, but I was interrupted, and I heard a voice say, we're in an ambulance. We're taking Drew to the hospital. He's had a stroke. We had been through so much, it wasn't fair. Drew was sent to a rehab hospital for six months. He was confined to a wheelchair and couldn't walk and had trouble speaking. He hated the hospital. All he wanted was to sleep by my side and the hospital wouldn't allow it. But with some cajoling and those baby blue eyes, <laughs> guess who won that argument? <laughs> so for six months, I slept in a hospital bed with my husband through it all, cuddling in the midst of, of nurses and doctors. We had to give up our privacy because we did. So then we went on and we got out of the hospital and we went home and we had to learn how to do everything again because the situation was different this time. And in that process, we learned the true meaning of intimacy, compassion, and patience. As we moved forward, we would spend every day together holding hands and just spending time together, enjoying the simple pleasures of life. And then one day, we were holding each other and he died in my arms. And I remember his last breath leaving his body, and it was surreal. See, I couldn't save Drew from cancer. He rescued me. He saved me from a life worth, he saved me, he saved my life, and he gave me purpose. It was through Drew that I learned the, the meaning of commitment, patience, integrity, compassion. And for this, I'm very grateful. So with that in mind, I repeat our vows for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Our next storyteller coming to this stage is John Weber. John shares a story about his need for speed and how it was just what the Pope ordered. Put your hands together for John Weber. Hello. Before we start the seven minutes, though, I would like to give a shout out to everybody here who's on their Valentine's Day. It's a great day for everybody. And it's my 35th wedding anniversary with my lovely wife. I love you, Carrie. All right, now let's start the clock. Boom. Hi, my name is John Weber. I'm ham radio operator WB5YQC. We <laughs> Thank you. So here in San Antonio, we're a military town USA, right? And so we have a whole lot of people that are either active or retired military that have radio background, electronics background, engineering background. And because of that, we have about 1,500 ham radio operators in San Antonio. We are considered one of the most well-oiled ham radio communities in the United States. In 85, we found out that they wanted us, the ham radio community, to work with the Pope when he came in 87 to visit. So we said, heck yeah, great test of our equipment and everything else. So we go to it. 86, they go and they ask me to be in charge of the communications for the papal visit. I'm honored, heck yeah, jump in with both feet. 87 rolls around, meeting or two before the big event. We're at the Red Cross building, Secret Service comes in, and they say, well, I'm sorry, but John Weber can't be in charge of the communications. All hell breaks loose, expletives everywhere. And finally, someone from the city 
management goes and asks one of the guys, hey, what's going on? Why? And they go, well, Mr. Weber has too many speeding tickets over 100 miles an hour, <laughs> and we don't think that he should be up there on the stage with the Pope. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I'm out of a job. So we found a replacement. Okay, great. You know, and he did an excellent job. But uh, everybody was set. We had 150 ham radio operators working that event on September 13, 1987. Uh, hottest day of September 1987, 97 degrees with all that fun humidity. 350,000 people joined us to party. Okay. Five buses of ham radio operators going in at 2.30 in the morning to go, and everybody had to be in specific locations. That's the thing about when you do these big events with major characters. <laughs> everybody is spot, and you can't move, except me. I didn't know what I was going to do. So we get in, and I'm at the Red Cross tent, and I'm thinking, what the heck am I going to do? I look over here, and there's a golf cart. And I look over here, and there's an EMT that's just twiddling his thumbs. I said, hey, man, let's go get some shit done. <laughs> so he goes, yeah, yeah. So everything, all his gear goes into the golf cart. I commandeer an ice chest from the Red Cross tent, and off we go. This dirt that this event was held on was all offset, big rocks, big dirt clods. They had clear cut, and there were sticks that were that big around and about that long that were all over the place like landmines. We were instantly busy. Everybody's getting cut up. People, are, knees are all... The, so uh, we're speeding around all over the place. Go back in, get more supplies from the Red Cross tent, come out. Go in, come out, speeding everywhere. Mass starts halfway through the event. We get on the radio that a woman has broken her water in the red zone, and the red zone is a is an eight foot tall chain link fence that surrounds the Pope, and all the dignitaries are in there from all over the world. Well, this woman was in there to get her kid blessed by the Pope. <laughs> there were a lot of them too, and oh by the way, this is what I wore. This is it, man. I I, I thought you know what I'm going to show everybody how it looked, because we knew it was going to be hotter than hell, and this is what we did. And the original radio. <laughs> so I look at the EMT, and we're, OK, we're there. So how many people, clap your hands if you were at the papal event. OK, do you remember that little golf cart screaming across the, <laughs> that was me. So we get there, and we're at the, we're, she's in an aisle seat. It's great. I think we're going to go in, get her, and out. Secret Service guy's there, and he won't open the gate. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we need to get her. He goes, no, we can't do that until the mass is over. So I go and I said, okay, left-handed here, what's your name? <laughs> and what's your Secret Service agent number? And he goes, why do you need all that? I said, well, if the baby dies, or if the mother dies, or if they both die, and the media wants to know who did it, I'm going to give them your name. Now, five seconds, it's open. We had Red Cross people already were with her, so I radioed up that I was going to bring her out. And so they brought her up, got her on the cart, sent her off. Uh, in that time frame, we had had the modulants turn on its engine, get the air conditioning running, threw her up there, shut the doors, and off we went. We were the only people that were mobile, remember. Everybody else is fixed. So the mass has ended, and the tens of thousands of people that came in on via bus were dropped off at spaces all over the place. So let's just say it was Wonderland was over here. Everybody that got dropped off from Wonderland was supposed to go back to that exact same spot. Well, no, Wonderland then, via made a choice, not a good choice, didn't tell anybody. Macrelis is over there now, Wonderland's over here. So you had thousands of people that had been in the sun all day, dehydrated, and the word on the radio was that some people were stopping sweating. That's heat stroke. Once you start getting that, next thing you go, you pass out, and after that, you die. So we go out there, and, and we, it is bad. So we scream back, and we went to the Raspa area. <laughs> so they had this huge Raspa area, and there were bags of ice 
lining the street. So we go and we grabbed all these bags of ice, and there were two uh, privates with a six-by army truck. And we said, hey, guys, throw every bit of ice that you can on here and go out there and just start spreading the ice around. And they threw the bags out, and people started, you know, sipping on the ice. We didn't lose a single person. Um, rescue. I think I was. I was rescued from being up on that stage. I got to do what I do best, speed. <laughs> Call to action, though. Here we are, 37 years, 36, 37 years later. We don't know who that child was that was born on the papal site. So my call to action to everybody here, let's go and find out who this child was. We have the 40th anniversary of the Pope visiting San Antonio. What is more puro San Antonio than a child being born in front of the Pope? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happened at the papal visit in 1987. I was uh, happy to be able to give this story to you guys. Uh, worth repeating, it's been around a long time. I've been watching it grow, and I think it's great that, I mean, we've got almost 200 people in here tonight. So thank you to Tori and the group, and KSTX and TPR and KPAC here is another brother station. Um, they do great work. So I appreciate you listening to my story. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next storyteller is Dana Brodsky. Dana shares a story about the importance of providing a safe space for everyone, no matter what their vice might be. Put your hands together for Dana Brodsky. Um, so I am a nice corporate lawyer lady now. <laughs> People are sometimes surprised to find out that when I was a freshman in college, all of my friends were junkies that I met on the streets of the East Village. <laughs> I had moved to New York to go to NYU, but I was really bad at making friends in class and I had no money. So this was like the perfect solution. These kids were really easy to become friends with because they were always just kind of hanging around outside on the sidewalk. Like you didn't have to be invited. And, and they didn't spend money on anything but heroin. And I didn't do drugs. I didn't even drink or smoke then. I just really enjoyed their company. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were um, funny and smart, and they were all kind of about my age, and uh, they had really good stories to tell, and I really appreciated being able to just sit around in a park for free all day, <laughs> hanging out with them. <laughs> um, the fact that they were all heroin addicts never really intervened that much in my relationship with them. I mean, I did have to get used to them nodding out mid-sentence every <laughs> once in a while, but... Other than that, it usually wasn't an issue. <laughs> Until <laughs> one day, I was hanging out with my friend Peter and his friend Nick, and we were in this lounge that was off of the lobby of my dorm. So you kind of had to walk past the security desk, but you didn't have to sign people in, which is good if you're trying to hang out with homeless drug addicts, for example. <laughs> Um, so we're in this lounge, and Nick tells us he's getting clean. He's picked up some methadone, and he is kicking his heroin habit. And we're like, good for you, Nick. That's awesome. And then Nick goes to the bathroom, and then a few minutes later, Peter goes to the bathroom. And then I'm kind of sitting there for a while by myself before finally I'm like, where are these guys? So I get up to go investigate. And just as I'm getting to the bathroom door, they come out and immediately I know that something is wrong. Nick is high, he's visibly high. But Peter, and by the way, Peter was like half the size of Nick. And Peter is, he looks like a zombie. He's staggering, his eyes are glazed over, he's drooling, almost foaming at the mouth. <laughs> and I look at Nick and I say, what the hell, 
man. I thought you were getting clean. And he says, well, yeah, but I had one bag left and we split it. Which, if you don't know, is the most junky answer to that question. Like, oh, yeah, I'm getting clean just after this last hit. Um, <laughs> So um, instinctually, I'm like, I got to get this guy out of the building. I mean, I was pretty young at the time. I didn't really think things through very well. But I let junkies shoot up in the bathroom of an NYU dorm. <laughs> like, I could have been expelled or kicked out of the dorm. And so um, I see he's still on his feet. So I decide to do this weekend at Bernie's thing and just start <laughs> pushing him out of the building. Um, we have to, I push him past the security guard trying to pretend like everything is normal and we get him out uh, the front door and just around the corner, just out of view of the security guard where he collapses on the ground. Now, it's the year 2000, I didn't have a cell phone, some good Samaritan called 911, I guess. And while we were waiting for the ambulance to arrive, Nick, <laughs> He was so tall and cute, and I kind of had a crush on him. And he bends down, and he grabs me by the shoulders, and he looks me in the eyes, and he says, I'm really sorry to do this to you, but I can't be here when the cops show up. And he takes off. <laughs> so there I am. I'm 18 years old. I'm standing there with my friend, comatose on the sidewalk. The EMTs show up, and they are being so mean to me. They're yelling at me, saying, what did he take? You know, and I'm like, oh, God, they think I'm like his junky girlfriend. Like, this is a panic in Needle Park or something. Uh, and so I kind of had to set them straight, and I say, um, you know, I, I don't know what he took, and like, stop yelling at me. I'm just his friend, you know? Um, so they let me go in the ambulance with them, and while we were in there, they did this thing where if you've ever seen the movie Pulp Fiction, you know the scene where they have to revive Uma Thurman after she has a drug overdose, and they take that big needle full of adrenaline and they jam it in her heart, right? So that's what they did to my friend. I mean, it wasn't as dramatic as in the movie. He didn't wake up all of a sudden and go like, Ugh, like that. But he, he didn't have a pulse, and then they did that, and he had a pulse, so it worked. Um, <laughs> and uh, so then we make it to the hospital, and again, people are being so mean to me. I really started to understand how you are treated when people think that you're a drug addict. It's not nice. Um, like, I ask the doctor, um, you know, is my friend going to be okay? And he just has, like, no bedside manner whatsoever. And <laughs> he says, well, he might never wake up. And if he does, he might be brain damaged for the rest of his life. Well, I mean, he woke up a little while later, and mm, he was fine. Yeah. I mean, he was a little groggy, but he was fine. Um, so then we kind of spent the rest of the day in the ER together while he was recuperating. And it was actually kind of a nice moment for me personally, because um, I was normally the low man on the totem pole in that social group because I didn't do drugs. So I was left out of a lot of stuff. So here was like the one time that I got to have some like one-on-one -on -one time with my friends and I was kind of like the big hero of the day. Um, and uh, it was really nice. And I thought to myself, like, mm, I don't regret becoming friends with junkies. <laughs> Not that bad. Um, and um, so everything turned out fine that day. And then about a year later, he overdosed again. But I wasn't there. He was in a room full of other drug addicts who either um, didn't care enough or weren't with it enough to get him help in time, and he died. And so I learned an important lesson then at uh, 19, which is that um, you can try to be a hero and save people in the moment when something bad happened, but um, ultimately, you have to accept that you cannot save people from themselves. Our next sto storyteller is Vanessa Seiler. Vanessa shares a story about how sometimes there are more important things than a race. Put your hands together for Vanessa Seiler. All right, so one Sunday summer morning, a few summers ago, 
me and my boyfriend at the time were at his house in the morning getting ready for this ridiculous 10 miler race or some other such nonsense. And while he's going through his just ridiculously long um, pre-race routine, you know, blending things and changing his running shoes a million times and asking me over and over and over again if I want a cliff bar, which I don't. <laughs> so I decide I'm gonna take the dogs outside one last time. He's got two big German shepherds. I'm gonna take them out one last time for a potty break before we leave. So we go outside, they're chasing balls, chasing each other, they're living their best lives until the demon spawn dog from next door starts yapping and barking at us. And it's super annoying, so that promptly ends our playtime. I heard the dogs inside and finished getting ready for this race. So we take off, the boyfriend and I, we're driving down Blanco Road toward 410. And we're coming up on that really wide spance of road in front of Holy Spirit. And what do we see but this little chunky nugget of a dog crossing the street. And of course, I'm like, oh, this dog, it's early in the morning, but there's still traffic and it's by itself and it's, you know, six inches off the ground. What are we going to do? So he slows to a crawl and looks at me and says, so what do we do? I'm like, we get the dog. <laughs> and he's like, well, he points out that we're likely going to miss the race. And I'm like, ah, I don't care about the race because one, I was really only doing it because there were tacos at the end. <laughs> And two, the little chunky nugget dog. So he pulls into the center lane. I scoop up the dog and hop back in the car and we get on the road to go find the nearest vet clinic so that we can get them to run a chip, see if she's got a chip and see if there's, you know, got, if there's people attached to this dog. So I've got this sweet chunky nugget little dog and, you know, she's a, hybrid Chihuahua San Antonio special, you know, one of those. You know the ones. She's curled up in my lap, drifting off to sleep. She's got this gray snout. She's an old girl. She has sweet brown eyes. And the whole, you know, it's, I've had this dog in my lap for two minutes and already I'm like, oh my gosh, this girl is so sweet. She's you know, I'm secretly hoping, well, if you don't find her parents, then I will take her. She's going to fit in marvelously with my old lady chihuahua dog and my other dogs. And what kind of bed am I going to get her? And what kind of toys does she like? Does she need special food because she's old? So all of this is fun playing in my head as we pull up to the vet clinic. But it's closed. Because mind you, it's about 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Because <laughs> again, crazy race. Um, so we get back on the road and go to the nearest um, vet clinic. And alas, it's open because secretly, I don't want to find this dog's parents. I want this dog. I've already, I've named her. She is Lucy. She is beautiful. I know what kind of collar she's going to have. It, it's, I'm planning our life together. So get out of the car. I carry Lucy inside because, you know, we're like this now. And the vet tech, so he explained to the, our plight to the vet tech, and so he leaves to go get the um, chip gun, and he comes back and scans her belly, and alas, she has a chip. Inside, I'm screaming, no! But, you know, on the outside, I'm pretending to be relieved. Um, so for privacy reasons, as I'm sure you can imagine, you, the tech can't just hand over people's names and their phone number for us to call and do whatever we want. So he's got to make the phone call and try to get in contact. So he tells us to wait outside while he does the deed. So she's sitting on my lap. I'm whispering sweet nothings into her ear about her new home and her new fur brother and sister. And we're out there maybe about 10 minutes or so. And then he comes out and he's like, well, OK, so I got a hold of someone. The chip is tied to a number and a person, but the guy told me, um, so the chip is registered to a male dog, we'll call him Spot. Well, the guy on the phone, this Lucy is clearly a girl, as I've already said, so the guy who um, the vet tech was able to get a hold of said, yeah, me and my wife did have a little boy dog named Spot, but he's dead. He died like two years ago. So 
obviously something is wrong, but there isn't a whole lot that we can really do about it at this moment. So we decided to just take Lucy back to the house and then we'll figure it out from there. So we get there, take her to the backyard, try to snap a couple of cute pictures so we can post it on social media. And we're posting it on Pabu, Snack Store, Facebook, you know, the works. And Lucy is over by this one particular side of the yard and she just won't stop sniffing along the fence line. And you know, I'm telling her, come to mama, Lucy. You know, come with me, be with me. You love me. And, <laughs> but she just won't stop furiously sniffing this one side of the yard. So then I hear it. And remember when I mentioned the demon spawn dog from next door? Well, this, what I did not mention was that this dog has the most irritating bark in the, wo uh, in the world. It's like this screechy, moany caw. It's just awful. And the dog barks all the time at night and in the morning, and it's, it's terrible. It literally haunts my dreams. And I, I look at her because I didn't see her bark. I just heard the bark. And I'm like, well, surely that's the demon spawn dog from next door. And then she does it again. And I, well, I, I think she does it again. Boyfriend looks at me and he's like, did you hear that? I'm like, of course I heard it. It's the most annoying bark in the world. It's like, but we didn't see her. We only heard it. So we're not sure. So we're just watching. We're like, come on, come on. You can bark, Lucy, you can bark. And it's not working. So we go back to trying to post. And then it happens. She barks again. We both see it. And it is indeed the most irritating bark in the world. So my boyfriend calls his neighbor and is like, hey, Alice, is your dog in the backyard? Now, mind you, I've never seen this dog either. So I didn't know. I only heard it. So he calls, calls Alice. She's like, well, I don't know. I let her out about 6 AM this morning. But I don't think she's asked to come back inside. Let me go check. Well, there's no dog in her backyard. So of course she runs over as I'm mourning the loss of this dog because we had a life built and we were gonna live this life. But sometimes when you try to rescue people or dogs, they don't need to be rescued. And that's my story. Thank you. Our next storyteller is Leroy Adams. Leroy shares a story about civil rest both in and outside his apartment. Please join me in welcoming Leroy Adams. I like to travel. I'm an avid traveler. Uh, a lifetime ago, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia, and I told the Peace Corps there would be one thing that would make me early terminate, leave early, and that would be rats. <laughs> um, so when I travel, there are two things I try to avoid violent political protests and rats. And on this night in Ethiopia, I will come face to face with my two greatest fears. It was May 23rd, the night before the Ethiopian presidential election. Everybody thought that uh, you know there would be peace and decency and calm would spread out the country. Nope, not at all. Weeks leading up to it, there were riots, there was violence. And so I'm sitting on my porch in my small Ethiopian town, watching my neighbors close their doors, which was odd because it was daytime in Ethiopia. At morning, you open your door and you don't close it again until the nighttime. So here we are at two o'clock in the afternoon, everyone's closing their doors. And I can see off in the distance, the protesters entering the town, carrying torches, angry speakers on the vans, screaming TPLF, TPLF, TPLF. Tigray People's Liberation Front. And so I got a text immediately from the Peace Corps that said, volunteers, code red, stay in your homes. If you have to be outside, avoid large crowds, but by any means necessary, remain in your home. And so I, there I was on my porch, having just received that text, wondering what I should do. And so my neighbor, landlord, if you will, is a community healer, priest in the community, he comes and he grabs me by my hand and he guides me into my house and he locks the door from the outside. And he screams back into the door in his best 
broken Yoda English. <laughs> Open the door, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can hear the protesters coming in, cars are crashing, windows being bashed, grass being burnt, young people screaming and yelling, TPLF, TPLF. So I decided to drown out the noise and watch a movie. So I got my laptop out and I put on Transformers. <laughs> Five minutes into the movie, the power goes out. Welcome to Africa. The power goes out. So I'm like, fuck, what am I gonna do? So I decided to try to go to sleep. Maybe I can drown out the noise that way. So I go to sleep. 10 minutes into my slumber, I hear pots and pans falling. Did I leave a window open? So I hop out of my bed, and as soon as I got out of my bed, the power came back on, revealing the cause of the noise. Not a window, not protesters, not transformers. This goddamn rat <laughs> in my kitchen eating my Jiffy's peanut butter. If you've ever traveled, you understand how difficult it is to get cheese and peanut butter. My mother had just sent that to me, which is what I yelled to the rat, but he didn't fucking care. <laughs> he didn't care. So I ran back to my bed, scared of rats, watching this rat eat my Jiffy's peanut butter with his eyes on my Doritos. <laughs> so I had to take, decided to take my suitcases from under my bed and build a wall into the kitchen area to barricade, block this rat in. So suitcase by suitcase, wall, built, ran back to my bed, tried to go to sleep again. The power goes out. And as soon as the power goes out, I was finally able to go to sleep. Five minutes later, the power comes back on, revealing the rat sitting on top of the wall of suitcases. <laughs> and I'm looking at this rat. So I take a shoe and I throw it. The road slowed down in that moment because as the shoe was going to that rat, and I promise you it would have hit this rat, the rat leaped and jumped behind my bookcase. And I'm like, what the fuck am I dealing with this mutant rat? <laughs> the size of a goddamn cat like this. <laughs> and so he lands behind my suitcase, this eight cat-sized rat with his eight-inch tail just swinging along. And for the next three hours, it's 10 o'clock, for the next three hours, I curled up in my bed, watching this rat swing its tail. The rat then runs behind my bed, and the power goes out. <laughs> Fuck. Where is this rat? So I'm in my bed like this. 30 minutes later, the power comes back on. I see the rat in the corner. The power goes back out. And as soon as the power goes back out, bang, TPLF, TPLF, TPLF. Protesters are kicking at my door. Peace Corps had warned us, as an American volunteer, you could be looked at as an opportunity and a moment of chaos. They're banging, and the power goes out again. For the next 30 minutes, I sat there in total darkness, no idea where this damn rat is. And the protesters, TPLF, TPLF, kicking at my door. Bang, darkness, bang, darkness, bang, darkness. I'm losing it. The power comes back on 30 minutes later, revealing the rat in the corner, shivering, because he too was afraid of the protesters. <laughs> I didn't give a damn, I want you out, is what I told the rat. I was so exhausted, so delirious. I had been up all day, and I'm sitting there looking at this rat eye to eye. I'm not gonna win this battle, so what do I do? I did the only thing I could do. I grabbed a blanket, I grabbed a book, and I climbed out of one of my windows. <laughs> and I told the rat, bro, this is your crib, have it. <laughs> it's on you, homie. And so I walk into the middle of the street. Right by this time, it's about one in the morning, the protesters have gone on, burning bushes everywhere, beat down cars, broken glasses, a few people straggling. 
no violence or danger in the area. So I grab, I sit next to a pole, put my blanket over myself, and I fall asleep. About 30 minutes later, someone shakes me awake, and I look up, it's one of my students. And he says, Teacher Lordy, why are you sleeping on the pole? So I explained to him the rat situation. He pulls out his phone, makes a call, says, come with me. By this time, there are hundreds of villagers behind us walking into the direction of my home. They are no longer protesters. They are my rescue team. <laughs> they are coming to rid my house of this rat. My landlord's daughter, fourth grader, tiny little girl, joins the crowd. Stay back. She runs into the house, steps out of the front door. Rat! <laughs> and she pulls me. She says, Teacher Lordy, come here, come here. And she takes me into my house and she points at black dots on the floor and says, Anchua, rat in Ethiopian. Anchua. <clears throat> What do you mean, mm. She's anchoa, mm. Are you telling me this anchoa, this rat has been shitting here for weeks? Poo, yes. So, the next day in the town, the story was not about the protesters. It was not about the violence. The story was Teacher Lordy, the American teacher, is afraid of an anti bissy little anchoa, which was this damn size. Thank you. Our next storyteller is Jim Barber. Jim shares a story about how a little piece of paper saved him from being stranded. Let's all welcome Jim Barber. Um, so my story takes place uh, back in about 1999. Um, I would, had just quit um, a soul-crushing job in human resources and <laughs> had moved to Guadalajara, Mexico for as long as my savings would support me. Um, and while I'm there, my parents uh, came down and they invited me to join them in Puerto Vallarta for the weekend, which is about a four hour bus ride down from Guadalajara. So I'm stoked. Um, they get there like on a Friday and I leave uh, Saturday morning to go join them at the beach in PV. Now we're staying at a all-inclusive resort and my parents are pretty generous when they're on vacation. And since I'm living off my savings, I'm like, all right, I don't need to bring much. Like a swimsuit, two changes of clothes, and money to drink for two days. And that's it. Um, I don't even bring my debit card, which you're going to find out is a huge mistake. Um, so I get on the bus. I get to Puerto Vallarta, and we have a great day. Um, my parents take us out on a pirate ship. We eat, I hang out with my sister. Um, and then that night, you know, my parents go to bed and I'm like, all right, we're going to the gay bars. Let's do this. Like, it's, it's your job as a gay brother to take your sister out, um, show her a good time. So we go out, um, we have a blast. We're meeting people, we're drinking, like we're laughing. Everything's great um, until Sunday morning. Uh, I wake up. And I feel terrible. And not, not like hungover terrible. I know what hungover terrible feels like. <laughs> I am barfing. I'm sweating. Um, I can't keep anything down. But I am, there's no way I'm going to miss brunch. <laughs> and I am sure that I can pull it off. And so like, I clean myself up. I get to my parents' room. And I'm still like trying to, to like be chill about it. And I throw up twice. And I'm just like, oh, no, I'm, I'm cool. I'm, let's, let's do this. Um, and finally, my parents are like, dude, we're, you're, you're not going to Broadway. You need to see a doctor. So they bring a doctor in, checks me out. 20 minutes later, I'm in an ambulance to the hospital, driving right past brunch. <laughs> so. I realize that's not happening, and we get to the hospital, and um, they check me in, they put in my IVs, and the whole thing, and, and they're like, he's gonna need to be here for a few days. And I'm like, all right, you know. And my family's there, and we're hanging out, we're talking, and my sister spends the afternoon reminding me how I've ruined brunch <laughs> for everybody. 
Um, so we get through it, and then that night, you know, I, I go to bed, and I'm thinking, all right, in the morning, you know, they'll come back, and I'll see them. This is going to be fine. Well, I wake up, and I see, like, the clothes that I was in kind of, like, stacked on a chair. And um, I ask, I'm like, hey, so my parents come by. And the kind of nurses look at each other. And the doctor comes in, he's like, um, they left. I'm like, yeah, I had to go back to the hotel, of course, but, like, are they coming back? He's like, they went back to the United States. <laughs> what they failed to realize is that I don't have a bus ticket for the four hours back to Guadalajara where I'm from. I have maybe $10 in my pocket. And the clothes that I was puking and sweating in the day before, because I had to, to pack my room. So my sister was just like, well, I'll just take his stuff. He's going to be fine. Um, so I'm like, all right. So I get through my day in the hospital, and they, they release me. And I put back on my clothes. And there's sort of this awkward moment at the front desk when I'm sort of hanging out. And they're like, well, you know, you can go. And I'm like, um, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's 1999. I don't have a credit card. I don't have a cell phone. But I reach into my pants. And I'm kind of trying to see how much money I've got. And there's this little yellow slip with a phone number. And it just says, Jose, and a few numbers. <laughs> now. In this moment, I could not tell you who Jose was. But I called Jose. Um, and in my terrible, broken Spanish, managed to sound breezy, like, hey, so what's up? You want, you want to hang out? And he, miraculously, he's like, yeah, sure, that's cool. He's like, well, where are you? And I'm like, um, you know what a hospital is? Like, <laughs> so. He said yes. So apparently, I've made some kind of impression on him. And you know, I hang up the phone, and the lady at the front desk is kind of giving me this look. And I'm like, look, I don't know how to say my parents abandoned me in a Mexican hospital in Spanish. <laughs> and you got to play the cards you've been dealt. So here we are. So I go outside, and I'm waiting. And it's you know, sunset. It's real pretty, cobblestone streets. Kids are playing you know, kickball. And this little black Volkswagen pulls up, because um, I made a point of asking him what he drove. So it wasn't awkward when I didn't recognize him. <laughs> and he pulls up and uh, opens, opens the door. And I peek in. And thankfully, he's just this nice looking kind of guy, sort of 30-something, glasses, not threatening, which at this point, um, <laughs> we're good. So I just kind of take a deep breath, and I get in the car with this stranger. And I'm like, at first, I'm trying to keep it real breezy. Um, but I catch the sight of myself in the mirror, and <laughs> I hadn't showered. And I'm wearing the clothes that I had been sick in for like days. And so I finally just kind of cop to it. And I'm like, hey, man, to be honest with you, um, I don't have any money. Um, I don't have a ticket home to get back to Guadalajara. Um, you know, I'm cool to hang out, uh, but if, <laughs> if I could get a shower, that would be great. And, you know, it's, I mean, I'm sure he's thinking, wow, like, I haven't even bought this guy a drink and he's already <laughs> ready for a shower. So this is when his car, like, turns away from going towards, like, the restaurant district and turns towards, like, a warehouse district. And it's starting to get darker. And he parks in front of what appears to be an abandoned warehouse. So at this point, I'm thinking, well, I may have to do some things today that I wasn't planning on doing. <laughs> but I'm going to get home. <laughs> and he explains to me, he's like, my parents don't know I'm gay. How am I going to show up with you at their house and tell them that you need a shower? So I'm like, understood. So I go in this warehouse, and it's not even like a bathroom shower. It's like an open shower in the middle of this warehouse. But I still, like, I'm, I got no options. So I, I take a shower and dress. And then he kind of comes up behind me and says, aren't you scared I'm going to hurt you? And I'm like, well, I wasn't. 
until you said that to me. <laughs> but as it happens, though, he was a really sweet guy. He hands me a towel, smelled like Swabitel, and like gave me clothes to wear, and took me down to back to the dist, you know, where all the bars are, and I started seeing people and lights again, and feeling a lot better about the situation. Um, he bought me dinner and then excused himself and came back um, with a bus ticket. And so he, we eat and he's like, how about, how about that drink? And so we have one drink while we're kind of waiting for the bus and um, when it's time to go, he handed me my bus ticket, even like cab fare to get back from my, the bus station to my house in Guadalajara. And you know, I said, you know, good night. I don't even think I hugged him. We're just like, thank you. Um, and you know, I went back home and you know came back to the states and started sort of the next chapter of my life. But you know, wherever Jose is now, uh, thank you, Jose. So. <laughs> Our final storyteller of the night is Alex Alcacer. Ooh, he's got fans already. Alex shares a story about how important it is to. Go with the flow. Please welcome our final storyteller of the night, Alex Alcocer. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I grew up in the neighborhood around uh, McCullough and Oblate, just north of Oblate. If you're familiar with that neighborhood, Springwood, Waxwood, Shadywood, we lived on a little street that was parallel to McCullough that had a ditch in our backyard, or the backyard, and then there was a ditch uh, back there. And this was about uh, 1984, 83. I was about seven or eight years old, and it was raining. And at the time, my best friend at the time that lived down the street, we decided, hey, let's go out and play in the rain. And then we ended up, hey, let's go play in the ditch. So we, it was kind of slippery, and we would jump in on one side of the street, kind of slide down the rocks, and then we would jump out on the other side of the street. It's a little Mexican slitter you know, if you know, if you know what it is. You know, it's perfect. Just we jump in and jump out, jump in, jump out. So it was raining. It was raining, and I think uh, what happened was north of, of where we were, I think the city had opened up the floodgates to let the water pass through. So... At the time, I told my friend, he's like, come on, let's go home. And I was like, no, no, no I'm going to do it one more time. I'm going to do it one more time. And so as soon as I jumped in, uh, I looked kind of over my shoulder, and there's just a wall of water rushing towards me. And so I'm like, oh, shit. And it, before I could even think, it kind of took me away. So immediately, I tried to start to reach for the vegetation and stuff that was growing out of the sides of the ditch, but all of the vines thorns were facing the opposite way. So as soon as you grabbed it, you would just get thorns, thorns, thorns all through your hand. So I couldn't get out. So my friend, he was out. He was already out. I looked at him. He's kind of on the, on the street, and he looks at me, and we're like, I'm in trouble. Oh, shit. And then there I go. So I get swept away going through the neighborhoods and uh, going under streets and, and stuff. And I knew I couldn't, I couldn't get myself out. So I decided, I, not decided, I knew I was a pretty good swimmer. And so I said, well, let me just go with the flow. I'm just going to swim with the current and kind of figure this out. And uh, just so you guys kind of have an idea, where I started out was, like I said, north of Oblate. And where I ended up was at the golf course over by Olmos uh, on, on the other side of the hill. And so uh, there I go, I'm going through the streets and, and under the streets and stuff, and I come across into, uh, I see one of the streets uh, has these three cement pillars that are coming down into the ditch. And I'm thinking, there's no way I'm going to make, if I slam into this wall, I'm dead for sure. So I took a deep breath, I went under, and then when I came back up, I looked over my shoulder and I was through it. I don't know which one I went through or how or what, but I was through it. So here I go, keep going, going through. And finally, there's a, an area close to the golf course where it kind of widens and the current slows down naturally. And so it was big enough to where I could swim to the side and uh, I'm holding onto a branch and I'm screaming, help, help. I've got branches on my ears. I lost a shoe, I had leaves everywhere. 
I'm screaming, help, help, help. And this is embarrassing. Uh, in order to keep myself calm, I started to sing My Country Tis of Thee to myself. I mean, I'm eight. I don't know. I'm eight. So, <laughs> so I'm singing My Country Tis of Thee. I'm yelling for help, help, help. And uh, there was an, an old lady that, whose house looked onto the golf course who was standing outside watching the rain. And she hears me, very old lady, and she starts walking towards me. And I'm like, no, no, get back, get back. No, 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 she's coming to try and help me. And so she goes, I'm gonna go get my grandson. And I'm like, what the fuck am I gonna do with the grandson? I need a grandson. <laughs> so, so when he came out, I don't remember exactly the details of what he looked like. I just remember he was tall, blonde, muscular, huge, six foot Nordic guy. <laughs> like, oh, fucking thank God. <laughs> so, so he comes out, he comes out, he kind of looks and he kind of does this like looking around. He runs back inside his house and he gets an extension cord and he comes back out and he ties himself off to a telephone pole and then he gets in behind me and he says, okay, let go. And I'm like, uh, let go. I'm like, no, he's like, let go. So I let go and I kind of drifted right towards him into his arms and we, he pulled me out. And I'm, like I said, I'm shoeless, shorts, branches everywhere. And so he goes, are you okay? I said, yes. He said, can we give you a ride home? I said, yes, that's fine. So him and his girlfriend, and we get in this car, and we're going, uh, again, if you're familiar with that area, we're kind of up the hill of McCullough, and then you get to the top and you come down. Well, as soon as we get to the top and you kind of look down, there's all these ambulances and fire trucks and police. I mean, they're like lighting up the neighborhood. They're going back and forth and back and forth. He looks at me and I look at him and we don't even say a word. We're just like, fuck, they're looking for me. So he doesn't say a word. I don't say a word. We just like ignore it, you know? <laughs> So finally, we get back to my house, and he's like, do you want me to come in and tell your parents? Are you okay? And I'm like, no, 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 no. At the time, my, my dad was like home alone. My mom, I think, was at Solo Serve, right? Solo Serve, yeah? She's a fucking Solo Serve. And so my dad, he's reading the paper, and he kind of does one of these. I walk into the house, and he kind of looks over, and then goes back to reading the paper doesn't even notice me. So I, you know, go straight to the shower and start washing off all this debris and stuff. So I'm in the shower. And while I'm in there, there's a knock on the door. And uh, my dad answers the door. And it was my best friend and his dad at the door. And he goes, Mr. Hulkester, Mr. Hulkester, Alex is dead. Tired, Alex is dead. Crying, grown man crying. And he was like, we fell in the ditch. And he'd been going up and down 281 looking for me to come out somewhere. And my dad is like, no, he's in the shower. He's taking a shower. <laughs> yeah. So I come out, I come out, and my dad is like, what the hell happened? <laughs> so later on, uh, it made the front page of the newspaper. There's a newspaper clipping somewhere. Uh, the guy ended up getting a commendation from the city. The fire chief uh, gave him a like, There's a picture of me somewhere in our house with him, the guy, my parents, and the mayor, and all this shit. And uh, <laughs> my parents. Also, my dad, my parents made me go to everyone's house that called 911 <laughs> in my neighborhood and tell them thank you for calling 911 on me. Yeah, for, for doing all that. So we went, I met all the neighbors and stuff. Uh, later, later on, years later, uh, I was at the little corner store with my dad and I heard somebody say, Alex? And I looked up and it was the guy. And I, again, I still didn't recognize him and he recognized my dad and they said, hi, how's grandma? Grandma died and still living at the house and stuff. This is years, years, many years later. And uh, you know, we kind of caught up a little bit and stuff, but that's my rescue story worth repeating. <laughs>